Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Kabir Considers. In this video we're going to react to the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. Now over the recent years, to be honest I've always had you know kind of a, an interest in space. I've always found it quite interesting you know planets all of that sort of stuff the universe but I've never really gotten into a lot of the historical things that have happened. Obviously I know that we went to the moon and things like that but I've heard the Challenger reference quite a lot but you know, I've never really actually watched a documentary that explained what exactly happened. Uh, I think it blew up. Like, you know, I, I think there were astronauts on board as well. Absolutely terrible, terrible disaster. What led to it? You know, was it a malfunction? Was it uh, a human error? Was it astronaut error? T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, we have main engine start, and liftoff, liftoff of the 25th space shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Everything's looking good so far. Oh, wow. So did it happen in space then? Engine's beginning throttling down now at 94%. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Altitude 4.3 nautical miles. Downrange distance 3 nautical miles. Challenger, go and throttle up. So it's, it's on its way to the space station. Oh. Oh my god. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. Major malfunction. Is that one of the boosters? We have no downlink. Reports from the flight dynamics officer indicate that the vehicle uh, apparently exploded. What? Your vehicle had exploded. God, imagine seeing that live. Man. The poor kids watching that as well. What happened? Like, because they usually test these things to such a degree. Up until the Challenger accident, NASA was a very untypical government agency. We were inventing as we went along, so you had a lot of freedom. It was viewed internationally as a fantastic place. The Apollo missions gave it an aura of invincibility. We were taken as the international leader in the space race, and no one was really expecting anything to go wrong. The Apollo pro It's actually crazy. We went to the moon. Like human beings went to the moon in the 60s, and we haven't been back since. Why? Like the technology's probably improved since then. Graham, uh, over the years that it actually operated, had very few launches. But NASA had uh, some very ambitious plans. Four minutes and 27 seconds to go before the start of this historic mission. The year was 1981, and NASA was about to amaze the world with Columbia, a new spacecraft that pushed the limits of imagination. They never before have sent a spacecraft into orbit that is going to come down as a plane. Instead of using a single rocket like Apollo, the shuttle was attached to an external fuel tank and two solid rocket boosters. Each of the boosters was constructed of joined metal tubes, and the field joints were sealed with two rubber gaskets called O-rings. Look at those huge engines getting ready to catapult this strange assemblage off the Earth. But all this technology wasn't cheap, and NASA had to come up with a new funding model. The creation of the whole shuttle program came in a different economic era than the Apollo program. So Congress and NASA decided the shuttle program could pay its way by carrying payloads into orbit. 
the Sex Department Rockets. of Defense, private contractor. So that's basically what SpaceX does now, isn't it? You know, putting like uh, satellites in space. Wanted experiments done in space would pay them to take them up on the shuttle. It was gonna be a real routine expressway to space. And unlike Apollo, the shuttle system was going to be almost entirely reusable. They had to return this hardware back into space as rapidly as they could. It wasn't long into the program they realized that that process was far more difficult than they ever anticipated. They were under constant pressure to launch. T minus 10, 9, 8. I'm getting a few butterflies uh, sure. myself right, right now. Four. We've gone for main engine start. We have. Boom! Lift the baby. There we go. <laughs> So much power in those engines. Go! Go, honey, go. Fly like an eagle. Columbia was a fantastic success, but NASA had to figure out how to make these technological feats routine. They predicted in the beginning that they would be able to launch 60 shuttles a year, that wow. NASA would, in fact, become self paying or self funded. We had two pads up and running. 60 a week, uh, 60 a year, that's like one every five days. That's crazy. I don't, even, I don't even think SpaceX launches that many now. I mean, they are quite regular, but it's nowhere near like every five days. But you'd have two vehicles out on the pad and they were gonna launch like three days apart. But that really never happened. It was an experimental technology and they just couldn't manage that many. So they continually fell behind. The shuttle program never had more than nine launches in a single year. We have a beautiful Still impressive. And to help meet their ambitious schedules, NASA worked with private contractors to build many of the shuttle systems, while NASA engineers analyzed data to see how well everything performed. NASA kept very good records of anomalies. The problem is, is that they ran into a lot of these. One thing engineers saw was the O-rings that sealed the booster joints weren't behaving according to design. On several flights, especially those at cold temperatures, rocket propellant had blown by the primary O-ring. The first time it happened, they accepted it. They tested it, leak. they thought they knew what had happened. And then the next launch, everything worked. And then a few more launches and it happened again. But each time, the secondary O-ring prevented gases from escaping the side of the boost. Why can't they introduce a third O-ring then? Would that then weaken, I guess, this joint over here? Because if it's always getting past the first one, if you have a backup one, just as an extra contingency. So rather than stalling the program to redesign the joint, NASA waived the requirements governing O-rings, which effectively made it acceptable to fly with minimal erosion. Even with the worst O-ring erosion they'd ever had, it hadn't failed. So they started to work on it, but they really weren't rushing. It didn't seem so terrible, but they continually expanded the bounds of acceptable risk. And then came the 10th Challenger launch, and a mission unlike any NASA had attempted before. They decided to make that the first flight that an ordinary citizen can fly, and that drew a tremendous interest from the public, plus the school systems are gonna show this live on television. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to a, perhaps the person you, you came to see, and that's uh, Krista McCullough, my payload specialist, teacher in space. My job at the time of the Challenger was the director of the Space Shuttle Solid Rocket Motor Project for my company, Morton Thiokol. Morton Thiokol was an engineering firm out of Brigham City, Utah, and had the NASA contract to build the shuttle boosters. Well, I am so excited to be here, and I just hope everybody tunes in on day four now to watch the teacher teaching from space. On the day before Challenger. Man. So you could bet her class, her students were watching this, her whole school. Oh my God, that's terrible. That's so bad. There was an overnight low that was record breaking. Got a telephone call from one of the program managers back in Utah that worked for me. And he says, Al, he says, we just heard that it might get down as low as 18 degrees by tomorrow morning. Good grief. I said, I'm really worried about 
these O-ring seals being able to operate properly at those kind of temperatures. The mission had already been rescheduled after routine delays. So now, Morton Thiokol and NASA scheduled an emergency teleconference the night before the launch. The engineers at Thiokol were very concerned. So they began scrambling to put together an analysis of temperature data. Larry Malloy was NASA's project manager for the solid rocket boosters. Then we went out to the teleconference. And uh, Roger Bourgelet, who was, who was kind of the O-ring czar at, at Morton Thiokol, did most of the talking. The recommendation was that we wait until it's 54 degrees before we launch. So I said something like, 54 degrees where? They had never drawn a temperature line before. And it meant a tremendous change to the shuttle's schedule. It isn't what they wanted to hear. In fact, uh, Larry made a comment. Thiokol, when the hell do you want me to launch? Next April? Thiokol's engineers in Utah uh, were caught off guard by NASA. I get it. He probably, you know, the delays and everything, it causes a headache. But I guess in hindsight, because we know what happened to us, it's an easy decision. At the time, there's no way he's thinking it's going to explode. Uh, strong reaction to their recommendation, so they asked if they could have some time off the teleconference to review the data in private. And after they went offline, Al McDonald was visibly upset, and he said, I wouldn't want to be the guy that had to appear at a board of inquiry if this thing blows. It goes wrong. And I said, I understand that, Al, and you won't have to. That'll be me. Jesus, man. At Viacall, the vice president was asking those engineers to stand up for what they said. Roger Beaujolais took the lead in the objections. He said, I, I can't prove it to you. All I know is that it's away from goodness in our experience base. But the engineers at Thiokol didn't have the data. So the vice president took the decision-making away from the engineers and asked the managers to decide. And they did. This is madness. It should have always been the engineers who had the final say-so. When it comes to hardware, especially hardware that's, you know, life-dependent, it should always be the engineers. Like, if you were getting on a plane, an aeroplane, and it was between the engineers and and the, I don't know, the manager of Boeing about if the plane is safe. You're gonna to listen to the engineers, aren't you? More than 30 minutes after the engineers had gone offline, Thiokol managers voted to reverse the recommendation and to launch the Challenger as planned. The teleconference became a focal point for the White House appointed Rogers Commission that investigated NASA after the disaster. There was not one positive statement for launch ever made in that room. What was driving here? What, what was to be achieved that uh, caused you to go? They just wanted to do it. NASA they pressured to the it. folks at Thiokol to change their mind. And it was clear to me that we finally came back and gave them what they wanted to hear. You know, we've been rationalizing this erosion since the second flight. None of the information the NASA managers were getting was new. This was not individuals getting used to something. This was organizationally supported. That's where the accident was inevitable. Once Thiokol reversed their initial recommendation, someone needed to sign off on the launch rationale. I did the smartest thing I ever did in my lifetime. I refused to sign it. I just felt it was too much risk to take. So just before midnight, McDonald's boss, Joe Kilminster, signed off instead. After the disaster, the commission concluded cold and joint design were major factors in Challenger's O-ring failure. It also squarely pointed a finger at NASA managers like Malloy. The commission mm. did recognize that there was pressure to launch, but they saw as it enacted by amorally calculating managers who were in positions of responsibility. I mean, so it was 18 degrees on the day that they were going to fly. 
and they wanted 54 degrees, the engineers. Yeah, it was probably like winter because one of the people, you know, said that it wouldn't be 54 for another six months. But you never know, like here in the UK, you do get random days where it warms up. Like, who's to say that they might have had a, a, a 54 degree day, you know, in a few months, like November, assuming it was September uh, when, they, when, they, when the flight took place. I found something completely different. So Vaughn began her own investigation. No one wanted this to happen, but intuition, you know, I don't feel good about this, should have been okay. And they applied all the usual rules in a situation where the usual rules didn't apply. Four, three, two, one. That thing is enormous, man. Look at the size of the booster. So much flammable, you know, liquid in there. We made a grievous error. So the real crux of the matter is, how do you get people to recognize when you need to do something different than what you've been trained to do? After Challenger, mm -hmm. the Rogers Commission prompted many changes at NASA, including an increase in the program's budget, adding a third O-ring to the booster joints, and... There you go. It, to me, it seemed like a no-brainer. Like, at the start of the video, I just said, why don't they just add a third O-ring? Like, would it have been really, really hard? Maybe they had to change the manufacturing process. But it just seemed like the, the easiest and most logical solution, didn't it? Oh, there's the play button. Some managers, including Malloy, out of the shuttle program. But there was nothing really about how to change the organization that came out of the commission report. Good morning, Discovery! Rise and shine, boys. It took two years for NASA to launch another shuttle. But once it was away, the program had 15 years of successful missions. Sometimes and then in 2003 to came the 28th Columbia launch, the space shuttle that started it all. It seemed like any other launch, but on the second day, someone called me on the phone and said, you've heard about the large piece of debris or foam that came off the tank and hit the left wing, caused a cloud, a poof. I said, no, I didn't. Columbia made it into orbit safely, but the concern was that if debris had caused damage to the left wing, the point of impact could be vulnerable to extreme heat and turbulence on re-entry. So just days after the launch, NASA formed a special team to assess the damage. We're supposed to have this analysis all wrapped up in three days, but we didn't know exactly where it hit. We needed a photo, an image that definitely says, here's where it hit and here's the damage. And the best visuals the team had to work with were a few grainy photos captured at launch. The decision to ask for more data, the need for it was unanimous. But smaller foam and other debris had fallen from shuttles before without catastrophe. And since Columbia was already in orbit, getting better imagery meant NASA Basically must do it from space, most yeah. likely by taking shots of the shuttle's underside from a nearby satellite. The next day, I get an email saying the answer is no. I called up the chief engineer and said, uh, why don't you back this up? And he said, well, I don't want to be a chicken little about this. What? And I was stunned by that response. And I said, uh, Chicken Little, the program's acting like an ostrich with its head in the sand. Management was worried about... Un Insane that you still have people with that attitude after what happened, you know, the explosion. You know, crazy. <laughs> Sarahly diverting Columbia from its mission, since foam damage had been generally considered to be a non-threatening maintenance concern. Linda Hamm, the chair of the management team, finally put the issue to rest on teleconference eight days into the mission, while Columbia's crew orbited above. We could lose an entire tile. I mean, it could be a, a significant area of tile damage. Man, I really, really want to experience zero gravity. It's like one of my sort of bucket list things. You know, I think Virgin Galactic have like a, they can take you into low Earth, low Earth orbit. I think it's like 200 grand or something like that. So I better start saving. I was just uh, reiterating with Calvin uh, that he doesn't believe that there is any 
um, burn through, so no a safety flight kind of issue. It's more of a turnaround issue similar to what we've had on other flights. All right, any questions on that? In the end, Ham received three requests for imaging from different parts of NASA. And they were all put down for different reasons. The similarity between Challenger and Columbia was the falling back on routine under uncertain circumstances. The day before the teleconference, NASA sent their only communication to the Columbia astronauts about the debris strike. And on February 1st, 2003, the crew began their return to Earth. Part of our engineering culture is that you should work through your chain of command. I will regret always why I didn't break the door down by myself. And we're ready, Willie, no deltas. Everything looked good to you. I don't see anything out of the ordinary. This is amazing. It's really getting uh, really bright out there. They had just started the deorbit burn. They're coming down. And um, we started seeing temperatures change higher on the left side versus the right. FYI, uh, I have where the damage four was. separate temperature transducers on the left side of the vehicle. The anomalous data confirmed my worst fear. The damage is starting to affect the, uh, the aircraft. Columbia Houston UHF comm check. Columbia Houston UHF comm check. I looked up and I saw one of our chief engineers in tears. We can't get the crew, she said. They've been incommunicado. Oh, no. It happened. It happened. What did... Columbia was destroyed on re-entry. Oh. After the disaster, Vaughn worked closely with the Columbia Accident Investigation Board, which concluded that NASA had ineffective leadership and a flawed safety culture. We are quite convinced that these organizational matters are just as important. Uh, Man, being an astronaut is just like a super high risk, man. Because if they could do all the testing in the world, but there's just so many things that can go wrong, so many variables. But I guess nothing is without risk, you know. People get into their cars and crash, you know, every day. So it's the phone. Ham soon left the shuttle program, and Vaughn's insights into organizational decision making have proven relevant far beyond the walls of NASA. This happens in many different kinds of organizations. I don't think that the general public got the position of either Larry Malloy or Linda Ham, and that their behavior was to a great deal determined by working in a very rule-oriented organization. After Columbia, NASA restructured the shuttle program's management team and required an inspection of the orbiter's underbelly on all trips to the International Space Station. All told, NASA had 133 successful shuttle missions apart from the Challenger and Columbia tragedies. But in its more than 30 years of operation, the program was never able to cover costs. And in 2011, it all came to an end when Atlantis touched down at Kennedy Space Center and NASA fully turned its attentions to smaller, unmanned spacecraft. Today, NASA pays the Russian Space Agency to carry American astronauts into space. We can never Resolve the but now SpaceX, an American company. ...of complexity, but you have to be sensitive to your organization and how it works. While a lot of us work in complex organizations, we don't really realize the way the organizations that we inhabit completely inhabit us. Very, very good video. Wow. That was a really well-told, well-made documentary. I think it's easy for, you know, for people like me, people like us to, you know, watch and just point our finger at the people responsible and say, why didn't you do this or why didn't you do that? But, you know, hindsight is 2020 vision, you know. It's so easy to point out errors after the error has taken place. At the time, you know, Larry Malloy, he was under pressure to make sure the schedule was not disturbed because they were trying to you know make this uh, the, the shuttle program profitable 
They wanted their nine launches per year. Everything looked okay, you know, and so far the O-ring situation had not yet proved disastrous. You know, yes, one of the O-rings was compromised and, and, and liquid was able to pass through it, I think oxygen, but it hadn't caused any explosion. So up until that point, there was no real need I mean, you could argue that, yes, as soon as any kind of malfunction is detected, you should try and fix it before you launch it again. But it had worked OK. You know, it is unfortunate. But one thing about life is it sometimes it does take catastrophes for mistakes to be resolved, improvements in technology and safety and things like that. You know, it's one of the things about life, but, you know, you've got to feel so bad for the astronauts aboard those ships that exploded and the one that, you know, was destroyed upon re-entry. They had families, they had friends, they had loved ones. <sighs> yeah, you, I mean, you could say that they died doing what they love, but, you know, it's still a horrible, horrible, horrible thing to happen. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next one.